Sounds good. Yep, thank you. Yep. Uh, so my name is Andrew Bergman. This is my colleague, colleague Tolly Renberg. We're both PhD students in applied physics uh, at Harvard University in Professor David Waits' group. And we'll tell you about our work uh, generating and assessing ideas for CO2 direct air capture technologies. Um, just to start off, we, we should say that, that this is sort of work that we've been doing uh, assessment-wise, and, it, and it's very new. So a lot of this talk, both the sort of new ideas and the assessments themselves, uh, stem from conversations with a lot of fantastic folks that we've, uh, that we've gotten to speak with, both in direct air capture and the carbon capture community. So uh, we won't read all these names, but we, we just want to say out front uh, how, how fantastic it's been that, they, that they've given us this time, both at conferences and, and in, in wonderful Skype calls where they've made time for us. So we'll credit those conversations we've had along the way, as, as well as making any relevant citations clear. Um, but we should also say, we're not done with our assessment yet, and we're still very new to this. So we will do some, some hand-waving. We'll make some hand-wavy comments, and we'll make clear when we're sort of uh, not completely confident about a calculation or an assessment we've made so far. Um, and yeah, because, because this is sort of a session that I think has a bit more of a policy economics focus, and, and to be honest, I don't, I don't think we're quite the perfect fit for this session, um, we thought we'd take the opportunity to sort of overview negative emissions as a, as a concept and direct air capture a little bit more broadly. And so we won't dive as much into some of the technical stuff, but we're happy to talk about that in the questions or afterward. Um, so yeah, so at the end of last year, there was a, a report that came out uh, from the National Academy of Sciences uh, on negative emissions technologies, which broadly, broadly are class of technologies to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, to reverse the positive emissions that we've been doing you know, for, for 100 plus years now and, and try to bring the CO2 concentration back down. And so this is a plot that you know, will look familiar to, to you all, uh, whether from sort of the IPCC 1.5C report or, or any number of other places. Uh, the exact shape is not, not necessarily important, but whether we're going to stay below 2C or 1.5C, Basically, sometime in the 2050s, in, in almost all scenarios, we're going to have to do on the order of 10 gigatons of negative emissions. And uh, you know, if, if we do, uh, uh, if we're a lot slower to reduce our positive emissions, then that, that number will get bigger. Um, so yeah, so so I won't go into this, but they, in, in complete detail. But what they did is they basically set up this this kind of uh, wordy metric, the safe potential rate of CO2 removal possible given current technology and understanding, and at less than 100 dollars per ton. And, and what you can see here is that there's a number of ways that you can do uh, negative emissions uh, you know, through, through plant life, through mineralization. But right here in the second to last row, you can see direct air capture gets a zero. And that zero comes with an asterisk that they put in the chart. They basically just said the, the cost for deploying air capture is just too high. It's, it's above $100 per ton of CO2 right now. And that, that comes from a variety of cost assessments. But the big two kind of come from the big two um, companies that currently do direct air capture. One of them, Carbon Engineering up in Canada, which uses sort of a liquid solvent collector, which we'll kind of talk about, estimates between $100 and $300 per ton. And uh, the other company over, over uh, in Switzerland uses a solid sorbent technology. We did a site visit there recently. They, they sort of say that they're between $400 and $600 per ton. But they're, they're all in the same ballpark, and, and they're, they're quite high. Um, so yeah, so if, if the report sort of gets at this very clearly. There's a high potential capacity for removing carbon with direct air capture. It can be regionally situated very well. It can go right next to storage. It can be on all day and all night uh, if you have the electricity. But because it hasn't received a lot of attention and funding, and because, of course, removing carbon from ambient air is, is tough at low concentrations, it's currently limited by high cost. Um, so yeah, so I, I won't go into this too much. You, you've been moderating very well, so I, I don't want to make sure we go over time. But uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, so why direct air capture? Sort of the, you know, we, we in the assessment we've done over the last six months and talking to a lot of great folks in this world, we um, we think that the challenges of, of the low concentration capture and at the high cost are still sort of uh, not enough to overcome the sort of good evidence that there is there is reason to to actually pursue DAC. Um, so we have a lot more negative emissions to do. I, I don't think I have to make that case, especially if. If we don't reduce nearly as much as you know, everyone says, we will have a lot more to do. And as we said, this hasn't been studied sufficiently. The one that I would love to get into in this session, happy to talk about in uh, questions, but probably don't have time during the main talk, is that it, it really does seem like there's a future energy system or a variety of them in which DAC can actually become economical. And it's a little hard to believe, but it seems like there's a variety of systems with cheaper PV, or we're actually doing chemical energy storage because grid scale battery storage ends up not being as efficient or, or as cheap as we think it will be. Um, if we have to offset um, 
for instance, we have a high levelized cost of CCS because we have uh, gas or, or uh, other fuel power plants that are sort of falling the load and only on 10% of you know, the year and are intermittent. Uh, it, it could be that actually DAC becomes much cheaper. Than anything, and then there's these regional benefits where you can, we can put it anywhere. And so there, there, there are other talks in this conference that, that sort of indicate why DAC might be able to compete with other, other CCS technologies um, at some point. So quickly, um, I'll just get into this before showing you a, a big chart. Basically, if, if we want to do direct air capture, we kind of need to, to think about the engineering side of things. And we're going we're gonna to come upon this sort of need to have some sort of swing of some physical parameter. Um, basically, we have very low concentration ambient air, 0.04% CO2. We need a strong affinity to bring that into a system. But then, if we actually want get, to get it out of our system, and either into some pure stream of CO2 to either put in the ground and store or to turn into something useful, a fuel or something else, we need something that's fairly weak. And so we need to swing some parameter to, to, to go from strong to weak. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of ways that you can think about doing this. The two that have you know, gotten the most attention, historically, industrial processes based on these have been around for decades for, for flue gas capture, post-combustion, and for a variety of other separations are temperature and pressure. They're the kind of ones you would expect. Carbon Engineering and Climeworks, the two companies I mentioned that do DAC, are both using those in, in different ways. Uh, humidity is a little bit less well studied, but Klaus Lagner, who's sort of one of the founders of this direct air capture, field uh, has really pioneered this using sorbents that, um, that trade sort of water for CO2. So when they get moist, whether it's through water vapor or through actual water, they will then give away their CO2. Alkalinity is a swing that's sort of a part of a lot of these systems. Uh, like I said, the big carbon engineering um, uh, scheme, it, it starts with a very basic solvent and then ends up going into a less basic um, uh, so, uh, concentration to, to actually hand off that CO2. But early, in the early days of DAC, a lot of folks were playing with alkalinity swings. The two that we're going to sort of get at that have gotten a little less attention, but we think are excited, um, and actually in the direct air capture world have basically not, not been tried at all, uh, are electrochemical pH. So Tolly will talk about a system that uh, is very happy when you pump in electrons to become sort of very basic on one, one side. It, there's a particular molecule that's really happy to to sort of uh, eat and, and give away hydrogen ions. And so it'll become very basic, one side very acidic on the other. And so it can in-gas uh, CO2 very well on the basic side, swing over the acidic side, and outgas it into, into a chamber. Um, David Kwabi, who's a postdoc with uh, Professor Mike Aziz at Harvard, uh, has, has started to work on that. Totally, I'll talk about that. And then the, the Hatton Group uh, here at MIT is, has started working towards those kinds of ideas. And then we'll, we'll talk briefly about a capacitance swing that you could imagine by changing voltage or charge density um, the Landskron group at Lehigh has done this with flue gas, but no one's really tried doing these kinds of things with, um, with direct air capture. This is going to be a big chart that I'm not going to go through of strengths and weaknesses, but I, we can talk about this afterwards if folks are interested. Highlight a few things on it quickly. Um, one is that from the, sort of an exergy perspective, the, the chemical engineers will insist that heat is the right way to go, that you never, you're never going to be able to beat it. Um, and, and so, you know, that... That makes sense. If, if, you, if you have cheap heat, you're happy to use it. But it also is, is much less targeted. It sort of hints at one of the weaknesses, which is that work lost to waste heat is going to end up being probably pretty high if you're just heating up a whole system and you're not targeting the precise binding sites, the place where CO2 really needs to be heated up to, to lower that affinity so that you can outgas it. On the other hand, if you're using electrons, you're really targeting um, energetically the CO2 binding site. So while the electrons are expensive, in that sense, um, and, and wasting them would, would be bad. They're also very targeted. Um, the last point I'll make, which Tolly will get at, is that this, this last swing really works as a capacitor, which means that when you, when you uh, de-energize it, you really can get electricity out of that. And so there's actually an opportunity, if you do it right, to actually get back some of the energy that you had to put back in. Um, so I'll hand over now to Tolly to talk about some of the methods we've been considering for electrochemical and capacitance swings. Literally hand over. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll, I'll just give you a bit of a flavor of some of the ideas that we've been thinking about and hopefully try to convince you that there's a lot more to be done in terms of the basic research of uh, direct air capture. And everything I'm going to talk about has not been tried at all on the industrial scale and really not at all on the direct air capture scale. Um, but before I get into uh, the details, I'll give you a quick primer on um, how we think about kind of absorbing CO2 into fluid, which is how a lot of these electrochemical methods are based. 
so essentially, this is the equilibrium diagram. Um, your, your ambient CO2 is in equilibrium with dissolved CO2 um, in your fluid. And then that, that CO2 uh, can become a bicarbonate. That bicarbonate can become a carbonate. And this, uh, this process here is extremely pH dependent. So uh, at pH of 12, you're essentially all carbonates. At pH of 8, you're all bicarbonates. And below 5, you're just in the aqueous CO2. Um, and the sum of these concentrations we call dissolved inorganic carbon, uh, this DIC concentration. So um, the simplest thing you can think of doing is just presenting a bulk fluid of a really basic solution. Uh, that'll drive your, your CO2 to your carbonate state. But then how do you push it back out? You have to find a way to decrease the pH. Um, and, and here you can see sort of what we've been hitting on, that this, if there's a way to swing this pH back and forth, you can actually uh, load in your dissolved inorganic carbon and push it back out. Um, and in fact, uh, what's, what's actually fairly striking is that if you go from pH of 7 to 10, you're going through a factor of 10,000 in concentration. Um, and you can actually get to one molar uh, concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon. That actually is fairly close to some of these solid sorbents, um, but has other disadvantages. So um, beyond just this equilibrium uh, diagram, we can we can do things like introduce chemical alterations to skew the equilibrium balance. So present something like a, a solid substrate or hold this out of equilibrium through uh, electrical charges or through sequestration or, or encapsulation. Um, and you know, one big challenge here is also uh, kinetics. So people use things like um, carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme found in human lungs, um, to speed up the conversion of CO2 to bicarbonate. Uh, but also, we can play various games to kind of push this system even farther out of equilibrium. Um, so with that primer, uh, hopefully you get a sense that if we have a way to swing this pH, we can put CO2 in and uh, carbon in and out of our system. And this is exactly what um, Klavi and Aziz have done in their papers up on the chem archive here. Essentially, they've taken their um, flow cell battery, but they've kind of opened it up to an air, um, exposed it to air. And if they can swing the pH um, through that and using their quinone, um, molecules, then they can actually drive the system quite well, which was really the inspiration to some of our ideas uh, that maybe instead of swinging just in time, you can also swing in, in uh, kind of break symmetry in, in the spatial dimension. So here you have um, what we're proposing, you know, two electrodes. And if you flow a weak acid through, um, you'll get a, a current through this transverse current this is technology that's been done through transverse electrophoresis, you're familiar, so it's totally not new, but a new applied to um, carbon capture. And so in this high um, pH regime, you're going to get CO2 to enter your system. When you turn off your voltage, your, your CO2 is going to, as long as you make sure to tune this, that the pH is less than 7 when, when everything mixes back together, your CO2 is going to leave. Um, and because there's so much data on uh, this transverse electrophoresis, we're able to do some simple estimations, and that's 25 kilojoules per mole CO2, which is actually quite close to the thermodynamic limit of 22 kilojoules per mole CO2. But a lot more work needs to be done here. Um, uh, just fairly briefly, I'll touch on um, I'll touch on this uh, supercapacitive swing absorption, which Andrew mentioned in sort of the, the bottom row of that table. Um, this is work that's being done by uh, Kai Lanskron at Lehigh, um, and this is just extremely preliminary. Uh, but they uh, use the property of a supercapacitance, which is that capacitance as mediated by ions. In this case, it's capacitance as mediated by ions in solution interacting with charges within the porous electrode. So when you turn on the charge, um, the mechanism is not exactly known, but um, you get most likely one of either two things to happen. That your bicarbonates will bind to your positive charge here. Um, and creating this, this double layer, or you would just increase the amount of CO2 dissolved at electro. So this is actually something that's being currently debated, and um, we're, we're thinking a lot about how to expand on, on these systems, create them, uh, establish them under continuous flow that allows you to bring in more CO2 continuously, but also allows you to sort of sequester the CO2 that's bound at the electrode um, uh, in, a, in a more targeted way. Um, so there's a lot more I, I want to say, but I just want to hand it back to, um, to Andrew to, to wrap up. Yeah, and I can say the, uh, the system Tully was just talking about, uh, while, while Kai Lanskron has done work 
uh, with flue gas capture, it's never, never been tried sort of with direct air capture. So this, this sort of flow cell is a way of trying to actually extract the lower concentrations of CO2 than, uh, than Kai Lansgren has in his system. So yeah, so we have a, a few more slides that we were gonna present, but we, wanna, we know you wanna get to, to questions. Uh, I can say also, by the way, this is sort of other, other sort of uh, flue gas stream technologies that have, that have uh, worked in this capacitive um, regime. I was gonna talk about solid sorbent DAC just for a couple of slides, but I think probably it's worth just passing through it. Um, basically, there's a variety of very cool ways that you can imagine driving these solid sorbent systems out of equilibrium. The thing I'll say quickly is that we've sort of thought of two principles, um, rapid temperature swings. So Climeworks, for instance, which uses solid sorbents, has a three hour sorption phase and a one hour desorption phase. There are ways that you could reduce this to seconds and sort of make use of the, the material's highest sort of rate of sorption, very low capacity of the material, but really move back and forth so that each cycle is really, really high yield. That's something we're thinking about, as well as thinking about how you can compete sorbents with one another, something that's done for other industrial applications all the time, but it hasn't been done for direct air capture. Another way sort of, of driving the system out of equilibrium. Um, have some sort of ideas here about how that could work. Uh, if, if folks want to talk about those ideas in the questions, that would be great. Um, one, one that's sort of exciting is uh, just using the very steep part of this, this Chris Jones at, at, uh, down at Georgia Tech has these cooperative CO2 um, uh, bonds based on the distance between amines and his sorbent. And so he can actually tune um, how, how sort of quick sorption happens. And that allows him to sort of improve kinetics. But if we decide to go right at that point and move very quickly back and forth over that kinetic steep point, then we could, again, imagine doing sorption and desorption much more quickly than on longer time scales. Um, these conclusions are mostly that we had a lot of other exciting ideas that we would have loved to tell you about, but we didn't have time. Uh, and quickly, I'll say there's this sort of solid sorbent and liquid solvent dichotomy that carbon engineering and Climeworks have set up. We're hoping to break that down by sort of introducing other ideas and ways of doing things. And uh, yeah, same group of acknowledgments. Thank you all very much for your time. Very good to see the excitement. There's a fellow I was with last week in China, John Gibbons, who is also very interested, University of Sheffield. So he might be someone you'd okay, like to okay. follow up with. Well, and his argument was around the cost, that when we get to this point where we're really going to need these, the $300 or whatever it might be, right. people will probably be happy to pay because it's the, you know right at the very end was right. his feeling that these will come into play and perhaps then people are actually okay. So there's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, I can say I think there are perhaps even settings in which, I was actually just saying this to a few other folks, I think there are perhaps even settings which, which CCS becomes costly enough that it's not worth doing anymore uh, all the time, or it's not possible to do it all the time, then actually direct air capture out in a field that can be on 100% of the time might be able to outcompete the sort of levelized cost of a CCS system that's only on 10% of the time or something like that. So. Okay, questions? All right, I'm going to go up the back and then I'll come down to you. Hi, um, great presentation. Like, I just wanted to um, extend the boundary a little, little bit and try to understand, like, is it possible for us to have other pollutants like SOX, NOx, and uh, other oxides to be captured like this? Because if that is possible, we can have, like, a very good solution for air pollution in, uh, like, many of the developing countries. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, it's terrible. like direct air capture. So I'm, I'm just thinking about a product wherein like you can just put it and uh, like maybe improve the ambient air quality yeah. in a small space doing it. So we're, we're terrible chemical problem. engineers, so we might not be the best people to answer that. Um, I th yeah, I think, I think what we can say is that obviously the lower the concentration of anything gets, the harder it is. So I think the, the, the approaches I'm familiar with do SOX and NOx capture at a point source, mm -hmm. which is you know much higher concentration, and, and you know there's even in the U.S. there's a whole plethora of regulations around that. I, I don't know the answer to how easy or possible that is to do uh, sort of out out in the in the ambient atmosphere. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. One one thing I will say is that uh, one advantage, even though the concentration in ambient air of CO2 is much much lower, because ambient air is like much cleaner than a flue gas stream in terms of pollutants it's 
easier in terms of chemistry because you don't have to worry about you know high amounts of socks and So I do think you should think about the chemistries pretty separately and designing them targetedly in different ways. Uh, yeah, and I do, but I, I actually agree about the scrubbers and the things that you can apply at the stack are really valuable and clearly are more can be greater uh, experience greater deployment under regulatory regimes. Um, my question actually is is more about my broad concern about uh, too much focus on direct air capture because then I get concerned that we're heading more towards a Rube Goldberg machine instead of just kind of stopping at the mitigation point yeah. because it enables companies to continue emitting. And per potentially stabilize. So I, I don't know. I know there's not a right answer to this, but I'm I'm interested in your thoughts. I would say that my position on this is anyone talking about direct air capture should be saying, in terms of the policy issues, that that is not the top priority now, and reducing emissions should be the top priority. And that my position, you know, is that we should be working on direct air capture to make it into the market, maybe like even 20 or 30 years into the future. And the work that's happening now, I see more of a way to drive down costs and find a way to drive down costs rather than take up a big market share or something like that. Yeah, because, and I know we're going to the next, but the, the challenge then becomes if you increase a lot of R&D in this area, it definitely yeah. detracts from other areas too, because there For is, sure. I mean, the piece of pie, it, I mean, you know, is it a, pie. what is this some game that we're looking at in terms of decisions about R&D? Yeah, I definitely have to say, I, I think that the like moral hazard concern is real and I think should be considered very seriously. And I've waffled on, you know, there, there are other things like solar geoengineering, which maybe I think it's a stronger moral hazard. I think that the, the sort of 1.5C report makes it clear how much negative emissions we'll have to do that. I think it's, it's sort of a more real near-term thing than maybe we, we would like. But to your point, I don't think there's very much direct air capture research going on at all. I think. There's almost no federal funding. It, I mean, arguably, there's no federal funding. So in a way, I, we, I think the two of us actually feel like we were, we were hoping to be like two more people in a very small pile. But if this was a big field, I think what you're saying would be dead on. It would be, oh, yeah. it would be. It's, it's, it's like yeah. Yeah. If you're arguing, say, I mean, I think if it, if it went too far, I would be arguing to decrease it. I, there is, I, yeah, it's an interesting thing though because I, I actually with John Gibbons had a similar question and his, his response was, well, you know, in this whole geoengineering discussion, he said we could just not do it and then if we need it, we've got to put our finger up and say, well, let's hope that it works. Right. Wouldn't it be better to have actually done some, to have right. some idea of that it's not the last hope that we actually understand what's going to happen, which is why you do R&D. Very interesting. At what? Yeah, yeah. At what point do you trade off on those things? But I think it's it is very early days. But I yeah. do agree with the way that we're tracking and the lack of action. The 1.5 says we're going to need negative emissions, and so how are we going to get a that? Lot a lot of it. And I think that's that gets missed so much by environmentalists. You know, they just don't understand around where that fits. But anyway, thank you. That's all the time. Thank you very thank much. You. We've, we've just taken over the conversation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so is it John? You who's going to be presenting?